Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is my review of the Sigma 23mm f1.4 DCDN, a mild wide angle lens designed for mirrorless cameras with cropped APS C sensors. Launched in April 2023 at a price of $550 or £450, pounds, and initially available in Sony E, Leica L, and Fujifilm X mounts, it delivers coverage equivalent to 35mm, ideal for general purpose use. And before you ask, there's no plans for Micro Four Thirds, Canon EFM, Canon RF, or Nikon Z versions, at least not yet. The 23 becomes Sigma's fourth DCDN prime lens, again designed for APS-C sensors, joining the existing 16, 30, and 56 models, all sporting bright f1.4 apertures. Placed side by side, you'll see all four lenses share a family resemblance with similar design and controls. If you're a Fujifilm owner, you already have the choice of two XF 23mm lenses from Fujifilm itself. The compact F2, which is a little cheaper than the new Sigma, and the high-end F1.4, which is pricier at around $900. Now, I try and make consistent tests in my reviews, so you can check out my earlier XF 23 1.4 review to see how that model compares to the new Sigma. The model I'm going to compare it side by side with in this review though is Sony's 24mm f1.8 ZA, a collaboration with Zeiss launched over a decade ago in 2011 when Sony still used the NEX or NEX branding for APS-C mirrorless cameras. I actually use this lens on my A6400 to film most of my YouTube videos and it still optimistically sells for around $800 or over one third more than the newer Sigma 23. So in this review, let's find out how they compare. Here's Sigma's 23 1.4 on the left and Sony's 24 1.8 on the right. They're roughly similar in diameter, but the Sony is 13 mil shorter and roughly two thirds the weight, thanks in part to its slightly dimmer aperture. Like other models in the series, the only control on the Sigma 23 is a smooth and well damped manual focusing ring. Likewise for the Sony lens, neither of which has any switches mounted on their barrels. They don't have optical stabilization either. Like most new Sigma lenses, the 23 1.4 has a rubber grommet to provide sealing at the mount, albeit not throughout the rest of the barrel. That said, the Sony 24 1.8 doesn't appear to be sealed at the mount at all, so do use it with some caution. At the other end of the lens barrel, the Sigma employs a 52mm filter thread and is supplied with a bayonet lens hood. The slightly narrower barrel of the Sony lens takes 49mm filters and that model is also supplied with a hood. Okay, now for focusing and unless otherwise stated, all of my tests here were made using a Sony A6400 body. Let's start with the Sigma 23 wide open at f1.4 and using single AF mode to pull focus between the two bottles. There's the usual wobble at each end to confirm the focus, but it's quick enough for general use. Switch the camera to continuous AFC mode though, and like most Sigma lenses that I've tested, the focusing speeds up and avoids the confirmation wobble for faster overall response. Now let's compare the Sony 24 at f1.8, where it looks a little faster overall in single AFS mode, mostly due to less of a wobble to confirm. Meanwhile, switching to continuous AFC mode speeds up the process again and eliminates that wobble due to the autofocus system exploiting the phase detect technology. Here's the same test, but now for video with the Sigma 23 on the left at 1.4 and the Sony 24 on the right at f1.8, both using a single AF area in the middle of the frame and with continuous autofocus. You can see both lenses are capable of smooth focus pulls without wobbling for video, although do so at different speeds here when using the camera's default settings. Note that some bodies may allow you to adjust the racking speed and response. Next for face tracking, starting with the Sigma 23, again wide open at 1.4, but this time using the full AF area with face and eye detection. Here you can see the lens and camera easily refocusing on me as I move around the frame. You can also see how this focal length and aperture are ideal for filming pieces to camera. Again, it's why I use this for most of my YouTube videos. Let's put the Sigma 23 on the left and compare it to the Sony 24 on the right, both at their maximum apertures of f1.4 and 1.8 respectively. Both are clearly good at this particular job and we'll be taking a closer look at how they render the backgrounds in just a moment. But first, focus breathing. Here's the Sigma 23 at f16, manually focusing from infinity to the closest distance and back again, where you'll notice the field of view shrinking at closer focus. Sorry for the wobbling here as it's an unstabilized system on the A6400. And for comparison, here's the Sigma 23 on the left versus the Sony 24 on the right, again both at f16 and manually focusing from infinity to their closest distances and back again, 
where you'll notice the Sony on the right exhibiting virtually no breathing at all. And impressively, as you'll see later on, the Sony is also focusing closer at the extreme end. So a solid result from this older lens here. Okay, now for my optical tests, starting with my distant landscape scene, angled so that details run into the corners. You're looking at the Sigma 23 at 1.4 here, mounted on an A7 IV body in APS-C mode, since I needed faster shutter speeds with the aperture wide open than my little A6400 allowed. Since the Sigma lens is designed to be used with a profile, all of the images and results that I'm showing you have distortion compensation set to auto in the Sony menus, where it corrects for some mild barrel distortion. Let's zoom in for a closer look at the middle of the frame with the Sigma 23 on the left and the Sony 24 on the right, both here at their maximum apertures of f1.4 and 1.8 respectively. Looking beyond the slightly different lighting conditions shows that both lenses are capable of delivering good results in the middle of their frame right out of the gate with minimal benefits to stopping down any further. Now let's return to the Sigma sample at 1.4 before heading into the far corner where there's some of the usual darkening due to vignetting, but on the whole it's respectively sharp in terms of details. Now I'm going to keep the Sigma on the left at 1.4 and now compare it against the Sony 24 1.8 on the right, showing a slightly different part of the pier due to its slightly longer focal length. But looking at the pier legs on both crops clearly shows the Sigma 23 on the left taking the lead in terms of sharpness when both lenses have their apertures wide open. As I gradually close the apertures on both lenses, you'll see the vignetting gradually lifting, but the Sigma remaining ahead on corner sharpness. Note that this is with both lenses focused in the middle of the frame, so it's also an indicator of field flatness. The Sony lens can be sharp in the corners, but you'll need to focus there or close the aperture down. Moving on to portraiture, the 35mm equivalent focal length is great for wider compositions that show a little bit more of the surroundings and the context without too much distortion on your subject to worry about. Here's the Sigma 23 at f1.4 where you can also get an idea of the amount of blurring possible in the background and also the rendering style. Just for comparison, here's the Sony 24 from the same distance at its maximum aperture of f1.8 where you can see its slightly tighter field of view and slightly different rendering style. Now for a closer look with the Sigma 23 on the left and the Sony 24 on the right, again at their maximum apertures. When viewed in isolation, both lenses are capable of sharp portrait details, but place them side by side and the newer Sigma lens on the left is visibly crisper, while also delivering slightly less busy looking bokeh in the background. Now rendering is always a personal choice, but I'm preferring the Sigma here, although do note that both lenses are also showing some evidence of low cut fringing here. Next for my bokeh ball test with the Sigma 23 again wide open at 1.4 and focus close to its minimum distance of around 25 centimeters. Let's briefly toggle between it and the Sony 24 positioned at the same distance, although this time at f1.8. Notice how the Sigma is actually delivering a similarly sized subject to the Sony, maybe even a tad larger here despite its slightly shorter focal length. This is due to the mild magnification from focus breathing at close range that you saw demonstrated earlier. Taking a closer look at both samples with the Sigma 23 on the left and the Sony 24 on the right shows both lenses exhibiting some outlining and textures within the blobs, but I'd say the Sigma blobs are a little bit cleaner overall inside and larger too thanks to its bigger aperture. As I gradually close their apertures, you'll see the impact of their respective diaphragm blade systems with the Sigma on the left rendering the rounder shapes that we're more used to seeing on newer lens designs versus the more angular shapes of older models. Now there's no right or wrong here, only personal preference, so let me know what you think in the comments. While focus breathing helps the Sigma achieve similar magnification to the Sony when positioned from the same distance, the Sony lens can focus much closer. So here's the Sigma 23 focused as close as I could to the ruler where it's reproducing a subject measuring around 138 millimeters across the frame. I'm gonna keep the Sigma image at the top and compare it now against the Sony at the bottom from its closer minimum focusing distance of 16 centimeters where it's reproducing around 92 mil across the frame. Now this might not make any difference to you at all, but personally speaking, the closer focusing distance to the Sony lens has actually proven very useful when filming very small details on the products that I review on YouTube. And it does give it greater flexibility for me personally, but again, your mileage may vary. At this point, I'd normally wrap up my review, but I've got one final test for you, which actually proved to be a bit of a surprise. Now, as you know, 
Both lenses are designed for use on cameras with cropped APS-C sensors, and as such you wouldn't expect either of their imaging circles to extend much beyond the corners of this smaller frame. But since I did have an a7 IV to hand, I thought I'd try both lenses with that camera using its full sensor coverage. So I'm going to start with the Sony 24 in the cropped APS-C mode, which it's designed for, followed by the camera set to full frame, where you'll now see the imaging circle as expected. So no surprises here. But now let's compare it to the Sigma 23 in full frame mode. And while some of the imaging circle remains visible as expected, it's far less extreme than the Sony. Now, to be fair, neither lens is designed to be used like this, but you can still see how the Sigma not only has a larger imaging circle than the Sony lens, but one that remains respectably sharp, well beyond the APS-C frame size. To better illustrate the difference in their imaging circles, I'll now toggle between a blank wall photographed with both lenses, again on a full frame camera using its whole sensor. Again, this is not how they're meant to be used, but the Sigma clearly has some potential for owners of full frame bodies if they're willing to apply a mild crop, perhaps when exploiting digital stabilization on video. And with that said, it's now time for my final verdict where I'm gonna show you a selection of photos that I took with the Sigma 23 on the Sony A6400 body. And as always, you can access many of the original images via my review of the lens at cameralabs.com. The 23mm 1.4 DCDN is a very welcome addition to Sigma's range of DCDN lenses designed for mirrorless cameras with cropped APS-C sensors. With so much attention these days focused on full frame systems, it's easy for owners of APS-C cameras to feel a bit left out, but the 23 1.4 proves we're not forgotten and delivers great results at this very flexible focal length. Focusing is smooth and quiet, the details are sharp across the frame, near and far, at the maximum aperture, and there's also potential for some attractive blurring in the background. On the downside, it's physically a little larger than I'd like for a walk-around general purpose lens on a compact body, and there is some visible local fringing, but overall it's a solid performer, especially for the money. In my tests here, it also mostly outperformed Sony's own 24 1.8, as you'd expect, or at least hope from a lens that's over a decade newer, although in its favor, the older Sony model does feel less plasticky, focuses closer, and exhibits little to no focus breathing. If you already own the Sony 24, like I do, I'd say there's absolutely no reason to switch, but if you're buying today, I'd now go for the Sigma 23 overall, a decision further cemented by its lower price. Meanwhile, if you're a Fujifilm owner, the XF23 1.4 remains one of the best lenses that I've tested, but it does cost considerably more, making the new Sigma an attractive mid-range option. At this end of the market, I'd also sooner have the Sigma over the cheaper Fujifilm XF23 F2, unless compact size is your priority. Sadly, it looks unlikely that we'll see a version in Canon's neglected EFM mount, but fingers crossed for Canon RF and Nikon Z versions in the future. I'd love to hear what you think in the comments and whether the Sigma 23 1.4 is the lens that you've been after for your APS-C body. And in the absence of a sponsored section in this video, you can help me out with a like and a follow. And if you're feeling extra generous, I'm always up for a coffee or you could treat yourself to my in-camera photography book or perhaps a Camera Labs t-shirt like the one that I've been wearing throughout this video. There's links for everything, including the latest pricing in the description below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.